And six months later, uh, your web team or your mobile team will come to you and says, oh, I like this one-click checkout feature and I want to implement it too. And maybe the in-store kiosks also want this feature for like people who tag their loyalty card. And if this is a black box, what they will end up doing is they'll kind of like borrow some of the code and use it as a scaffold and build another place order feature for mobile. Um, they might also do one more for store. And what you are doing here essentially is creating more and more black boxes. And you are creating this spaghetti code of integrations where um, all these APIs do what they say they do, but uh, they're not in the, in the underlying system and the code they were developed with are not emphasizing on reuse. So even though we are building new APIs, we are not building them from the ground. Uh, we are always building them from the ground. And a solution th to this would be treating APIs and integrations as a, as a, a, a pieces of the same puzzle. So what I mean by that is let's talk about what an API is firstly. So API typic a typical modern API um, would contain three aspects. One would be the API contract, which we have been talking a lot in the API days conference around API designs, OAS contracts and whatnot. So this is a part which tells what is this API going to do. Then the business logic, this is like the meat of the API where all your code that you write, all your business logic that you implement goes. And then finally connectivity because APIs typically uh, are an interface to get data or to like uh, propagate updates, but you still need connectivity to the systems, to the data stores that it is talking to. So there is a piece of it, which is connectivity. And when you build these APIs, you can also expose integrations as APIs. So let's say you connected to SAP once, uh, you might have the opportunity to just expose it as an API. So every time you want to connect to SAP, you don't have to figure out the libraries and the dependencies and the credentials that are needed to connect to SAP. You can expose this as an API, having the same three building blocks that we talked about, a contract, uh, some logic and connectivity to SAP. And what have you have done by doing this is you're exposing integrations as APIs. And these are like the fundamental building blocks of uh, API led. So API led is essentially APIs and integrations working together. So another way to build the same use case that we saw initially is uh, we have all these systems at the bottom, which do different enterprise functions. And the first step would be to create these things called system APIs. And system APIs are nothing but APIs that unlock the data from the system they are uh, connected to. So in our, our use case, we are creating a customer API, an orders API, uh, ERP API, payment API, and a shipping API for all the different systems that we had um, in our organization. We use this as the, the building blocks in the foundational layer of the next uh, uh, layer of APIs called process APIs. And these APIs uh, replicate the business processes that your enterprise might have. So customer profile, so finding out uh, all the details about customer, uh, a single customer by a single API call or order fulfillment, an API that talks to different systems to fulfill an order. So these kinds of APIs can be created at the process level. And then finally, you use these process APIs or business processes to create innovative experiences for your customers. So in this example, we are using the web API uh, as an experience layer, which is uh, working with the website and essentially calling these APIs um, or the web API is calling the process API and the process APIs are calling the system APIs. The advantage of doing this is reusability. So in the same use case, if we wanted to build a mobile API, we, we need not reinvent the wheel. We need not connect to SAP again and connect to Visa again and connect to shipping services again. We, simply need to reuse the same APIs that we build in the business process layer and create a new experience layer API, which is just a proxy that is calling these, these other APIs. Another uh, API comes in in the similar way, like the in-store one, you can again reuse the same APIs, again, not need to connect to individual systems repeatedly. The other benefit of this is like, let's say you wanted to remove this legacy order management system and replace it with a new cloud-based system. This is also much simpler to do. 
Imagine all of this code to connect to the legacy order management system was implemented in the mobile API and the web API and the in-store checkout API. This would make you uh, change all the experiences just because you flipped one system um, that is retrieving your data versus up using this approach, you can version your order API and have minimal impact on the process layer so that your business processes still remain the same, although the underlying data store or the system of record has changed. Another benefit that we see with this is it democratizes innovation across your company. So different people can be owners of these different layers. And to, uh, for the system APIs, it could be your central IT team. Uh, which is responsible for you know maintaining SAP or maintaining CRM uh, who have access to these systems. So they could be responsible for creating the system APIs and allowing other people to act, access this, uh, these systems through APIs. Then your line of business IT, a lot of companies have um, you know line of businesses which might have their own IT teams and they are the business process owners can can control the process layer and pick and choose what system APIs they want to use to formulate these business processes and what exactly happens in these. And then finally, the developers who are consuming, who are going to be building these experiences can partner with the, the, the MuleSoft team and kind of build these experience APIs uh, to uh, in, in, in a way that they can easily consume firstly and also in a way that it fits their need. A lot of times we will see uh, developers using APIs uh, which were not meant for a specific purpose, but they like hack it around and, and create something that uh, the API was not meant to do. So this kind of prevents it since the experience layer is meant for the experience that they are building. I'm going to take a pause, uh, if, check out if there's any questions. If there's any questions, keep them coming. Okay, no questions so far. So this is uh, API led in a nutshell. What we are going to see now is how MuleSoft can help you build this. So there are a few benefits of using MuleSoft uh, and these are the ones that actually make you successful in making, making these API-led architectures a reality. Um, and first is accelerated delivery. You need to be able to build fast. You cannot have a, like time limits or SLAs that, that say like, I will take six or eight months to build an API. You need to be fast because when situations like COVID arrive, you need to be very ag agile and kind of build these things um, over the night. The other part is automated security. We live in the world of like data breaches and they are fairly common. So you need to be sure that security and governance are enabled by default. Um, resilient operations, which means your uh, system should not be down. Customers expect you to be up at 1 a.m. Um, at on 24 7, seven days a week. So that to do that is hard. And anyone who has worked in operations, you, uh, you know that it's uh, achieving these kind of like reliability. Um, SLAs is typically very difficult. So you need resilient operations that can do this. And then finally, future proof foundation, which kind of is more towards a stat uh, overall IT strategy where you need to be building for the future. You cannot be building something that only works for a year or two years. You need to think about the next five or 10 years. Um, and the changes in technology that are happening. So you need to build things that are flexible and built for change. Now, what we will see in the next section is we'll see different uh, personas uh, using the MuleSoft platform uh, and building the same, the one-click checkout experience that we talked about. And we'll see the different toolings that are uh, that each of them uses based on, on, on what, what they do. So let's start with the MuleSoft developers. And in Mules, uh, the, what Mules of developers are going to do here is they're going to create an API design. They're going to build some business logic and we are also going to see how to build an integration with Mule. So let's look at the first guy. Uh, his name is Marty. Marty is a Mules of developer from the IT integration team. And what he's going to do here in the next section is he's going to unlock. So there is a uh, order management system based on MySQL and a lot of people need access to this data. So instead of providing the database credentials and asking them to access the data themselves, he's going to create a system API on top of this MySQL database and uh, let other people access the data through the API. And just as we talked about, the first step to creating an API would be, and we are, we are following the design first API methodology here. I know there is a lot of code first evangelist here as well. 
but we're going to use the design first, create an API specification first. So to do this, we are going to navigate to any point platform and we are going to go to this thing called design center. And design center is like the central place to uh, design your APIs. Uh, we are going to create a new API specification. Let's call it API, API days, orders API. And since uh, this guy is not like an expert at OS or RAML or any of the design specification languages, he's going to use this thing called the Visual API Designer, which lets you model your API very quickly. And this is probably the fastest tool I've seen to create API design. So let me show you how this works. Let's call it API days, orders API. And the first thing we are going to do is define a data type. Let's call it the orders data type or yeah order data type and then define it or instead of defining the whole data type i'm just going to paste in an example a json example of what an order looks like for my company so it has all these fields and just as i think of this api i have um, the uh, orders resource here where i want to have the get and the post method and i want to call the get method get orders uh, get orders and then the to this, in the response, I want a status of 200 when somebody gets orders. And in the body itself, um, I want to be able to uh, return an array of orders. And for the post method, we are going to call it create orders. And again, for the response, this time we are going to respond with a 201, which stands for created. And for the body, to create an order, people need to pass in the, the data type that we just passed in. Um, what was important here is while I was doing this, the API was being modeled in RAML and OS at the same time automatically. I say automatically because this sounds like magic to me. And I typically, when I start with, start with API design, I create a scaffold like this so that I know what different uh, resources I need. So I can add multiple resources. I can do nested resources. Um, and I quickly add, like create all the methods that I want uh, and you know get the spec right out of the box here. Not only that, you can flip on this switch called mocking service, which automatically adds a server for your API. And you can hit the try it button and request uh, uh, this URL and you will get the response. And this you can take this URL and let's say like I'm in my terminal, I can curl this and then I'm gonna just JQ for pretty print. But you can see I can also make a request through a terminal and I get the same response. So this API works like a real API now. Um, all that is missing is, is, is uh, publishing dummy data, which is fine for you know uh, starting to build in the development environment. Next step is I'm going to give it a version. So I have an asset version and an API version. Asset version is just like, what's the version of your design spec? An API version is your version of the API itself. And I'm going to publish this to this thing called AnyPoint Exchange. Now, AnyPoint Exchange is um, the MuleSoft product to as a, as a marketplace for APIs, both internal and external. So before I go into what was created by publishing, uh, I want to show you Exchange. So Exchange is like this kind of a marketplace where you can see different APIs within your own organization itself. So other people who might have created APIs and published them. Or uh, you can also see things provided by MuleSoft. And MuleSoft continues to produce uh, different connectors, templates, examples, uh, API templates, whatnot, that you can just use from our library. But if you go back and see, look at the API days order API that we just published, it auto generates this portal for us based on the, the OS or the RAML spec. So get orders, post orders, we can see the two methods we created with the names. You can also get code samples. So like here's our curl request that we just made. So curl requests, Python, JavaScript, you can simply copy and paste this code into your application moving forward. And if you remember correctly, this was still giving us the mock response. So the developer who's building like a JavaScript app or a Python app can still get this to work even though you haven't built uh, an implementation yet, or even though you haven't added, added any logic to this API. So you can create these portals and this is not limited to the ones created on MuleSoft. If you have RAML or OS file, you can go to exchange, publish a new asset, and you can select all these different kinds of design files and it automatically generates the portal for you. So now that we have created our, our 
documentation or auto-generated documentation and the design spec, the next step would be to add business logic and actually get the data from the order management system. And to do that, MuleSoft provides another set of tooling, and this one is called AnyPoint Studio, which is uh, used for building APIs, uh, API implementations. So let's call our API phase or order API. And Studio is also integrated with uh, Exchange. So you can search for the one, the, the spec that we created earlier. Here, the orders API that we created earlier and hit finish. And again, let's hit finish. And what this is going to do, it's, it's going to generate an implementation scaffold for you. Um, if you're coming from the JavaScript land, it is like OS to a Node.js app generator. Similarly, we are from, from, a, from a design specification, we are creating a scaffold to create a, a MuleSoft API. And it automatically creates, uh, firstly, all the errors. So like, you know, bad request, 401, uh, 401 not found, all the 400 level or 500 level errors here. So it automatically handles those uh, routing errors uh, to you. And it also creates the routes for each one of them. So the get order route is here and the post order route is here. Now to add business logic to it, MuleSoft provides a lot of these different modules. So let's say like you want, uh, in our use case, we want to get information from a database. So you can drag and drop the database module here. And let's say we want to, for the get orders, we want to fire a select query. So you can drag and drop the database connector here where it will let you write the SQL query that you want and kind of add the credentials here. So that's why it's giving us an error. It also has other controls. Like if you wanted to write like an if else thing, you, you have this thing called a choice router. So like I can do choice and I can say like when condition is blah, blah, like do this database query, otherwise do this Salesforce query or something like that. So it lets you build your um, logic in a graphical way. So you don't have to write any code. And to show you how this works, I have actually configured uh, the order API beforehand. And in the database, I have just said like select start from orders and in the configuration, all I need to do is pass in my credentials. So this is a simple MySQL uh, database with all the, all the different credentials here. And I can also test the connection right from within Studio. So it kind of makes an outbound connection and uh, tests if, if the database was being able to connect successfully. If I go back to the message flow, I can also see the different fields being returned from the database. So I don't even have to know the tables in the database just because I wrote select star from order. It figured out that these are the fields in the orders table and it figured out these are the things in the API uh, response format. And to do the transformation, a lot of times you have to transform the data that is stored in the database to what your API clients want. And to do that in Mule is very easy. You can just drag and drop these things from left to right and it writes the script, Dataweave script. Uh, Dataweave is a MuleSoft specific uh, transformation language and it lets you do from simple to fairly complex like JSON to XML, CSV to JSON, CSV to XML, whatever kind of transformations you might need uh, in these kind of scenarios. So once you build your application logic for each of the routes, you can simply right click on your application, uh, go to any point platform, hit deploy to Cloud Hub. Uh, Cloud Hub is MuleSoft's managed IPaaS, uh, uh, which stands for Integration Platform as a Service. Uh, it's, like a, it's like a deployment platform where you can deploy APIs without having to worry about you know, the, the run times or without having to worry about like all the infrastructure that you need. So I can just say like, I want to run this on a one week or EC2 machine with like six replicas and you know, Mule, uh, any one platform does all the heavy lifting for you. So just like that, let's go back to our slides. Just like that, uh, we were not only able to design the API with the visual API designer and generate an auto-generated portal, we were also able to implement or write the business logic for this API within like you know the five or 10 minutes that we were looking at the demo. And on the connector side, you have connectivity to all these different enterprise systems um, just by using the connectors that MuleSoft provides. So that's how you can be faster to deliver these kinds of projects. Now let's look at another use case for another developer, right? Now these guys are uh, Kelly, from, who is an IT admin from Line of Business. Her use case is whenever updates happen in Salesforce, uh, it needs to get reflected in the database. 
Now, instead of accessing the database, now that Marty has created this order API that we created in step one, instead of calling the database directly, she's gonna call the API now. And Kelly is not an, not an API builder or an expert at building APIs or building apps at all. So she's going to use this online IDE that Mulesoft provides called Flow Designer. So let's see how she does that. So again, she goes to any point platform and navigates to Design Center. And this time she creates a new meal application. She calls it uh, API days SFPC sync. And uh, what we what we are going to see about to see now is uh, what we call Flow Designer, and this is a web based IDE to build APIs and integration projects. So once this loads, we will see a prompt where it says, what is your trigger? How does this integration get triggered? And in our case, it's Salesforce. So luckily, Microsoft has a Salesforce connector. Uh, so we can simply select the Salesforce connector here. And the connectors are like abstractions on the API. So if Salesforce provides APIs, the connector itself is an, is an abstraction of those APIs. So it lets you use this API without knowing the API. So we'll fire this integration whenever something is modified, but you have other triggers as well which could be like platform events or change data capture, or those kinds of things. Now, what's our target? And our target is the API days order API that we just built. And the, the different uh, REST methods, the get and the post methods are now operations. So using the APIs is also very simple. You don't have to be an API expert to like know what to do with get orders or create orders. So you can, we'll just, we're just gonna say create orders here. And it creates a scaffold flow for us where we have the Salesforce uh, data weave and then the create orders here. Now it's showing the red light here because again, we have to put our Salesforce credentials. Uh, in Flow Designer, your IT team can also publish credentials here. So you don't even have to enter those. Maybe your, your Salesforce IT team has already published these credentials. So you can simply select this and hit save. And as you save it, you can see that it's starting to like look inside Salesforce and see what are the different objects available within Salesforce, just like we did for the database. Uh, it's looking inside Salesforce and seeing what's available on Salesforce. And this is a polling based operation. So I'm gonna say like run a poll inside Salesforce every uh, five seconds to look for any updates that might have happened. And here I'm gonna look for my custom object, which is NTO order. Uh, so every time there's an order modified every five seconds, this integration will fire. And again, if I open the data weave card, I'm going to quickly create our API format for the order. So this is on the on the left hand side. What will happen now is it looks inside Salesforce and figures out these are the fields that that are there in Salesforce, and then here are the fields that our API needs to, to do the post request. Uh, here we also have this this preview button which uses uh, machine learning to create mapping suggestions on you know how these fields should be mapped, and I can simply accept these or I can like make any changes that I feel that are not appropriate and uh, leave the, the integrations as is. I can also write any custom script if I wanted to, uh, but I'm just gonna leave it as is. And that's about it. So next step, we are gonna test our, our API, so our tester integration, so I'm gonna hit test. And while it runs, let's go to Salesforce. Um, and let's say we are a support agent, and there is a case to update shipping address for Rachel Morris. So I'm gonna go to that open up her order, which is here. And let's say she wants the, the address to be 102 instead of 201. So let's hit 102, make sure the, the app is running. So our app is running here. So as soon as we hit save, and I'm gonna count to five, one. Hopefully this works, yeah. So you can see our integration just got fired. If I open up the transform card, you can see the, this, these are the different fields that Salesforce sent us. Um, in this format. And because of the transformation we applied, it automatically created in, uh, the transformation into the orders uh, data format that we talked about earlier. So 
the transformation is done. Here's what like the orders API is doing where the input is this and the output should be like a, uh, if you look at the attributes, it should be a 201 that we configured earlier. Cool. So going back, what we just saw again was speeding delivery, easy to use drag and drop builder, reusing the existing API that Marty had built in the section one and kind of like building on top of that. And then again, we are able to use the connections that IT has sent. We were able to transform the data even better because of the, the recommendations that were provided to us through the machine learning algorithm. And that's how we uh, not only build fast for your first project, but you also accelerate uh, other projects over time. Okay, so our API is built, it's deployed, it's being used by the company. Um, then there are other personas in the company that have other objectives. For instance, the API owner. And this is Bruce, who is the API owner. And his objective is to add governance, security, um, different features on the API itself, for which he will use uh, API management solution. So once the API is built, these, these APIs need to provide certain experiences and API management is an ideal solution uh, for him to be able to do that, as well as adding some security. So let's see how he does that. Let's go back to AnyPoint platform. And the first thing I want to show you is this security configuration that applies to all his APIs. So he has configured these three types of uh, security policies. So DOS, WAF, and uh, HTTP limits. Uh, DOS is protecting him against denial of service attacks. So he has put like, if someone calls this API and creates authentication errors four times in a row, block them. And this not only applies to a one API, it applies to all their APIs. So like if you put wrong authentication credentials for order API four times in a row, your access to customer API will also get blocked. So these are the rules that he has applied at a higher level where he has applied these to, um, you also have the WAF policies, which let you configure OWASP top 10 rule sets. You can simply enable these. You don't have to be a security expert to do this. You can just say like, this is what I want and save and uh, this does all the heavy lifting for you. The next thing he does is he goes to API manager, which is the central place to manage your enterprise APIs that you build on, build or manage on MuleSoft. Um, and the orders API that uh, we were creating earlier, I've already created an example for that, but it, it has been added here. Um, this could be the API that you build on MuleSoft, but this could also be any API. So if you wanted to, if you already have a built out API without API management, you can paste the implementation URI here, and then you can easily deploy a proxy that is going to uh, serve as a proxy for your API implementation. So he can go to policies and you will see that the automated policies for rate limiting has been applied to this project already. And automated policies is also like a governance factor that they have applied to all their APIs. So all their APIs need to be rate limited with a certain rate limit. And IT has configured this, I have no control, I cannot turn it off. It's already configured for me where I can not go more than one request per second. Now, if I go to Postman and I have this like URL here, uh, pasted here, and if I make a request to this API, I can just get all of this in plain text. It contains sensitive information like payment information and customer email, which are not supposed to be exposed firstly. And also uh, there is no authentication on this API. So on the API manager side, you can, you have these out of the box policies that you can apply, which involve like all the categories from security, transformation, compliance, quality of service. Uh, and what I'm going to do here is apply the client ID enforcement policy and the tokenization policy, which are the two policies here. I've already done applied them. So I'm just going to enable them here. And just to show you how these are configured, if I were to just edit this, it's essentially saying use this tokenization service, uh, which also uh, something that Mulesoft provides. And I want to tokenize the customer email and the payment card information, uh, both uh, from the payload. So I've applied these two policies. What API manager will do now, it with, without any downtime, with zero downtime, it will apply these policies to um, this um, endpoint because it's a proxy endpoint. So let's make another request to this or 
let's make sure the policies are applied let's give it a second it does take a few seconds to propagate since uh, my implementation is in aws um, but uh, the policies are also not limited to out of the box policies you can you know create your own custom policies as well we have a whole policy engine that you can use to to create these let's check again if the policies have been applied yep so policies are applied now we are getting an authentication denied error and even if i were to pass the the, the client id and the client secret as headers and make another request you can see the data is now uh, tokenized with a format preserving token and what i mean by format preserving is it keeps the data format uh, consistent to what it was but it replaces it with a, a token that is just like a dummy value uh, in its place so we have the data now tokenized and the beauty of this is you are storing the data at, as encrypted at rest and you are publishing data in terms of tokenized data but you still have access to the actual data you can hit the detokenization endpoint and use this token to get the original values as well so i want to recap in terms of uh, or actually let me also use uh, incorrect authentication um, credentials here and make a request and it says invalid client and i can make one more one more one more my quota has been ex exceeded and at some point i started start getting a 503 so this is where the the waf or the dos policy that we configured where user cannot make more than four um, authentication errors at the uh, consecutively and since I did, it's blocking me and it's blocking all my traffic to this endpoint. And I can't now access any other endpoints either. I can't access the orders endpoint and it's just going to block me at the edge itself. So, so just recapping what we saw is different layers of security. You will hear this term layered security countless times. So I want to show you like how we did this. So first thing is the platform itself is secure. You have different compliance standards like HIPAA, SSO, rollback, access control, all these features make the, the AnyPoint platform, the MuleSoft platform itself secure. So that's like layer one of defense. The second layer of defense is edge policies. So these are the policies that we applied like the OWASP top 10 protection, the DOS, the denial of service protection, those kinds of policies at this layer. Then the API level policies. So these were like rate limiting policies, the client ID enforcement policies, these automatically got applied to an individual API at the API level. And then finally, data security, which was through our tokenization policy, where we were not only able to uh, protect the API itself, but also the data flowing through that API. So when you use these multiple layers of um, uh, security, you, you get what we call automated security, and security and governance is built in by default. And uh, what we just saw in the demos here is like these out of the box policies, the uh, the security layered security, and also on the one thing that we did not cover is managing API contracts. So like the contracts that these API might have can all be seen here at from one page. So you can easily revoke, delete, um, look at the client IDs for those, and look at different kinds of reports for those as well. So you can also manage these API contracts with these. Uh, we have 10 more minutes. I'm going to take a break and see if we have any questions. Looks like we do not have any questions. If you do have questions, feel free to ask. I'm going to try to include the answers as well in the rest of the presentation. The next persona we have is Roxy, who is a DevOps engineer. And her goal is to um, make sure the APIs are up and running all the time. And she works with the operations team. So a lot of her time is looking at analytics and reports for how their APIs are performing. So let's see how she does this. Um, the first point of entry for Roxy is this thing called AnyPoint Visualizer. And AnyPoint Visualizer is our, our way to visualize your, what we call application network. So I'm going to show you, there are different views in it. So I'm going to show you one of the ones that makes sense. Yeah, but in a typical company, you will have like a lot of APIs and integrations talking with each other, right? And a lot of challenging uh, when things break, like a lot of bigger challenge is like to figure out what is breaking and why it's breaking. And this kind of, if you click on one of them, it shows you how the dependent systems are talking to each other. And let's say if this one was failing, like how is other 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 systems impacted? You can have a troubleshooting view, uh, which kind of lets you see different, like we can filter on the failure rate and see like which one of these is failing. None of these is failing. I'm gonna show you one that actually does fail. This one, but it would show up like in red, just like here. 
if this is failing, you can press this view dashboard button that lets you look at the dashboard for this API. You can see different runtime metrics like you know what's the inbound outbound traffic, how is it performing since we run on a Java based runtime, what's like the JVM in uh, dependencies and what's going on there. Um, what is interesting here is also the ability to build custom dashboards. So you can pass in um, custom metrics and create your own dashboard. And we have a whole framework of building these. And you can also pass in business insights like uh, what is the revenue being generated by this order API? Or how are people like, um, or how much money has been made since this order API is being used through our web app or through the mobile app? And for people who are trying to uh, justify the ROI and the monitor, like how, how does this API benefit your company? These graphs are great for like, you know, C-level engagement of how you are making an impact through the technology that you're building. And then finally, she can also set up these things called functional monitors. So um, a lot of times you will use third-party APIs and you don't know if the API is always up and running. So you can create these things that run on a periodic uh, schedule so it runs this one runs every 15 minutes checks for like what the payload is when it's being sent what is being returned what the status codes and whatnot and alerts you uh, and you can get alerted on slack on pager duty or whatever tool you might use for getting alerted but it alerts you if the third-party api is down and kind of does this kind of functional test uh, on and on and the last feature i want to highlight here in terms of monitoring is the log search which is uh, Kind of, if you have used Elasticsearch, it is very similar. But you can easily look at logs for multiple APIs in the same view, filter on like an individual API, filter on different log levels. So I'm gonna filter on the error log level and quickly get to the root cause of like, what is causing this error? What is causing this API request to fail? So that was Roxy. That's how DevOps teams and engineers who are uh, interested in monitoring can utilize our platform. So that's how we enable resilient operations, uh, runtimes from a single UI, visualize the whole application network, get technical and business insights in the same view, and then set up alerts and functional monitors. And then lastly, I want to talk a little bit about like integration architects who are not necessarily building APIs themselves, but are thinking about API strategy, thinking about long-term plans for their APIs. And this is Jack, who is the senior integration architect at NDO. And the first thing that they get out of the platform is, you know, these three layered approach of API led connectivity where they're decoupling everything. So they're able to build an architecture that can scale and can also be adaptable when systems change or when, you know, your plans for different experience change. So that's one. The other thing is these portals are, MuleSoft provides these portals. So one is available on any point exchange. If I go to any point exchange, and click on our, let's say for our API days order API, we make our instance public, which it already is. Um, and if I go back to the assets list, I can click on this thing called public portal and it auto generates the same portal for other people outside of my organization to, to consume. And in this case, like they can click on any of these APIs and get the same documentation that we saw earlier. They can use the same code examples. So it creates a more you know, immersive experience for developers who are using these. So you can easily create these portals to externalize your APIs and join the broader API ecosystem. Uh, but if you want even more features on your API portal, so there are instances where you want to create a full-fledged developer portal with like engagement and a, a fully-fledged content management system baked into it. Uh, we also have uh, a co collaboration with Community Cloud, Salesforce Community Cloud, and we have built a new product called API Community Manager, which is a more uh, tailored experience to your users. So this is an, an API portal that was built as a point a proof of concept, uh, but it has more things than just like a, being a developer portal where it has like these things called news and events, which has a which is backed by a fully fledged content management system. Um, you can run analytics on how people are logging in, what APIs they're using, what are they searching. It can have a full-fledged blog, um, have different API groups where you can group different APIs into API products. Um, so the integration architect here can kind of blaze through these and um, kind of understand uh, the API architecture and the deployment models and how they want to expose 
their APIs as the broader API strategy. So this is how the platform lets you build future-proof foundations. Uh, it is flexible and built for change. You can easily adapt disruptive technologies. Uh, it, uh, the APIs that we built on Mule, uh, they can be deployed on prem on a hybrid infrastructure, hosted. It can be hosted by MuleSoft with Cloud Hub that we just saw. And it could also run on public cloud. Uh, I have the Amazon logo here, but it runs on any public cloud or any hardware, bare metal hardware, if you please. And the ability to expand to API programs with their portals and kind of guide you through that your journey of making your APIs public is something that we, we strive for. So just to summarize everything, uh, the platform benefits every team. So we have the Mulesoft developers who can build fast. Uh, they can build both APIs and integration faster. We have the API owners who can uh, add API experiences and make sure the security and the governance on API is built. We have the DevOps engineers and the operations uh, teams that are making sure that the lights on the APIs are always up and running. And we have the integration architects who are uh, planning for the future and building an API strategy that works. But don't just take my word for our, our approach and our methodology. We have hundreds of customers doing the same thing using our API led approach and getting tons and tons of benefit out of using this and tons and tons of reuse. There's a lot of stories out there. Um, you can go through them and kind of see how different people are using it. And then finally, please, 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 if you have questions, ask them now. If you want to get started and do some of the things I just did, you can do it with a 30 day trial. You can go to developer.mulesoft.com slash tutorials and you can learn how to do some of the things I just did in the in the session. But meanwhile, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them right now before the session ends in two minutes. And I'm happy to also let you present if you want to present and ask any question. Awesome. Thank you, Venkat. If you have any questions, let me know. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for attending. Cool. I think I am done. Um, I'll just stick around until the platform kicks me out, but our session's concluded. Thank you all for joining. I really appreciate. Um, you can chat with me. You have the people tab where you can find me and send, send me DMs if you want to learn more or see any individual features. But thank you all for attending. Thank you, Aditi. To anyone who's viewing, we just got done with the session. I'm just hanging around. If you guys have any questions around MuleSoft, 